Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AF Good Innovation Factory uh, Grand Finale. So my name is Josh Choi from the ITU, International Telecommunication Union. I'm very, very happy today to moderate such a great session. Uh, today's Innovation Factory is the final stage of the year 2022 uh, journey of the program. And we've selected the top five teams among 52 startups from 18 countries who applied for our program throughout the year. So we've got a great five teams today. So we've got Cipremo from Brazil, who developed AI-powered natural uh, disaster management and grammars, which actually uses AI to decarbonize the agricultural sector, and also one of the uh, Shell Game Changer program winner of the session in July, uh, July we did. And also Telebionics, uh, which is a digital healthcare startup, who also won and uh, the session that we did in partnership with the IBM, and then there are one of the IBM Hyperprotect Accelerate teams. And also Kita Technology goes from Nigeria, who provide the smart farming solutions to African uh, smallholder farmers. And also they are one of the World Food Program uh, Innovation Accelerator startups. And also we've got Blue Sea Robotic System from the USA, and uh, they uh, developed autonomous hull cleaning robot. So we've got the startup from agriculture, robot and healthcare so diverse. And so I'm very, very excited to see their pitch today and also good luck for all of you. And now let me introduce uh, today's uh, prize. Uh, firstly, I'd like to give big thanks to our sponsors. So as you can see here, and the, we've got the, the logos of all our sponsors here. So we've got AWS uh, Startups and the Res Capital and the Gorilla and, and Kurutora uh, Brayada Institute and Falling Technologies and I Prestige Emerging Fund. And then they currently offer the really, really great benefits today. Yeah. So firstly, well, we're going to offer Cash Pride, which is sponsored by I Prestige Emerging Fund, which is five uh, KUS dollars cash price. And also due diligence by Res Capital and also marketing and advisory support by Gorilla Corporations and Toro Brayada Institute, and also cloud service credit by AWS. So the winner will get a 6,000 valid credits for AWS service, and the second place will get yeah, a 4,000 valid credit. So all our sponsors are here today as the judges, so they're going to provide more details on what they are going to what they are gonna to offer to our finalists. Okay, so now let me introduce uh, our judges today. So firstly, we've got uh, Dr. Melissa Sassi, who is the former head of IBM HyperProtect Accelerator Program. And also she's now the uh, the partner of uh, Venture Capital P3 Network. So uh, Melissa, uh, well actually um, she's been a really great a support of, of this program. So can you please tell us about your activities, also your role in the startup scene, and also um, some of the, your activities in the United Nations? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, just a quick mic check. I assume you can hear me okay. Yep, good. Awesome. So I'm Dr. Melissa Sassi. Um, I have spent uh, the last 10 years uh, working uh, with startups. Um, and everything that I've done over the last 10 years of the, all focused on doing well while doing good. Uh, so that's making the world a better place and making money at the same time, because I believe that you have to do both to create long-term sustainable solutions. A lot of what I focus on um, 
you know, is uh, investment readiness. And I've been on this really interesting journey over the last um, six months. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I worked on Wall Street. I worked at Microsoft. I worked at BlackRock. And I, I ran corporate accelerators. I, I worked with early stage founders that are out there changing the world. And as I watched this founder do it their um you know 100 million dollar raise or 20 million dollar raise or 50 million dollar raise i realized what am, what am i getting out of that and then i also realized i am guiding founders on how they can build scale get access to capital get access to revenue but what was i doing and so i quit my job and now i'm a full-time entrepreneur I am still, uh, you know, figuring out what that means. I don't know if I'm succeeding or failing, but at least I'm no longer an imposter. Talking to entrepreneurs about doing the thing, I put my money where my mouth is and we'll see where it goes. So thank you. Thank you very much. As we always have thank you a lot for your answers. Yes, and so I'm really, really expecting your new role as, a, you know, chief penguin of the world. As always, you introduce people like that in the uh, in your your socials everywhere. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have a fun job title, you've got nothing. <laughs> hey, okay. All right, thank you very much. All right, and uh, we've got uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen Ibaraki, who is the chairman of uh, Red Capital, which is one of our sponsors today, and also he's the founding member of the AI for Good uh, Summit. So, Stephen, please tell us about your recent work in the field of AI and uh, some of the details of your kind of offer for the finalists today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Josh. It's an amazing program, Re literally the best in the world, the Innovation Factory. So happy to be part of this program. I, I've been involved in entrepreneurship as a serial entrepreneur, uh, building my own uh, first computer when I was 10. And I've been advising Microsoft since the 70s. In fact, uh, this year, I won my 20th global award from Microsoft uh, for the work I've been doing. And um, as I mentioned, a serial entrepreneur, I'm an investor. I've been investing for about 40 years. In fact, uh, one of the uh, investments we made in 2019 as the first uh, seed investor uh, became a unicorn uh, last month. And in fact, they were listed on the NASDAQ board for uh, hitting over billions. So so an active investor, I work across uh, more than 100 global projects on uh, with more than uh, 1 million uh, CEOs, investors and scientists. And uh, as Red's Capital, we, we, we are... Uh, um, family offices that came together to do investment. And we have our own fund, of course, uh, which is doing really, really well. But when we do investments, our um, vetting rate is about one out of every 10,000 actually then goes through uh, full due diligence. We have a pretty active uh, screening process. So what we're offering is you're already in. <laughs> you're going to get through our uh, screening process. And if we see that this is something we want to get behind, then we will, uh, you know, open up our investment networks uh, for either this uh, next year or the year after and so on. And also I, I, I do um, interviews for people like ACM, which is number one in computing science, IEEE, which is number one in uh, electrical engineering and so forth. So I'm offering, I can do an interview which appears on various channels as well. And, and of course we'll mentor uh, as active investors. All of my partners have been investing for about 40, 50 years. So. Thank you very much, and also and congratulations. Hey, Josh. Sorry. Hey, Josh. I forgot. I forgot to say what I was offering. I went on talking about myself, and I left that out. So I wanted to just quickly mention that I will do um, an investment readiness workshop for each of the the startups to help them um, think through how do they track milestones, what are the things they need, so that when they go to Stephen and others, they're ready to truly have that conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And also, Stephen, also, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, comment. Also, congratulations that you got all the unicorn startups. And also, uh, as far as I know, the, the due, diligence, due diligence provided by the Red Capital is really competitive. So once all our finalists today, you know, pass their due diligence, you got a huge, you know, growth step next year. 
with thousands of uh, you know investor networks. So I'm so excited to see your progress next year. Let me move to uh, to introduce to Mr. Joseph Hopkins, who is the founder of I Prestige Emerge Front and the Falling Technologies. So Joseph, thanks a lot again for your really kind offer and your all time support for this program. But I think you can also bring more value just in addition to cash price through your you know, uh, program and your mm -hmm. services, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, yeah. first of all, nice to see you again, Josh. Um, and uh, great to be um, uh, a part of some fantastic uh, judges on the panel. So that's cool. And, um, you know, Josh, I'm so excited. Uh, I know uh, the folks that are here today in terms of the companies that are pitching, uh, these are literally the, the number ones on each of the, you know, the, the innovation factory events we had. So it looks like we got one climate control company. We got a couple of um, agricultural farming sort of com companies. We've got one smart energy company. And then we've got, of course, a digital healthcare. So all of these are cool, cool industries, uh, very cool technology. So congratulations to all of those companies. I'm really looking forward to hearing the pitches. Uh, um, so I prestige fund, it's basically um, um, incubator type fund, um, accelerated fund. Uh, we, we do put our money where our mouth is. So we go through, much like Steven said, we go through a pretty uh, robust uh, vetting process. But we we will literally fund about three to five companies uh, per year. Um, that's a that's a largely a family controlled trust type fund. So it's largely coming from our money, my family's money. And um, but we will we'll put in probably upwards of three to six million dollars per year uh, toward companies. So. Um, so from that fund, we're just we're, we're just going to throw in five grand uh, this year. We need to pick that up a little bit, Josh. And so I, I was talking to my guys who sort of run that fund, and I said, guys, let's 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 kind of double up on that next year. So this is our third year uh, at the Innovation Factory, and I promise you, we'll, we'll we'll increase that next year for sure. And then the other thing I'd like to offer um, uh, for maybe the top three folks. It sounds like Josh, you've done a great job with really offering some other things from the other uh, judges here, but Maybe the top three folks can reach out to us uh, offline and let's see what we can do also to help them along. Um, we like to do more than just uh, give a $5,000 grand prize, but we can we can manage those private discussions uh, offline. So I'll, I'll offer that to the top three uh, finalists or, or the top three finishers today. And then, uh, and just real quickly on our advisory company. So we have an advisory company that does uh, really three things, technology advisory, our bread and butter is doing very robust IP evaluation. So companies who have IP, they want to bring us in. We, we will come and do a very robust evaluation opinions on, on their assets. Uh, they will use those to garner investor confidence. Uh, and uh, one of the things we have been able to do with that company uh, is also to help companies leverage financing using our services. And so we're involved with probably three quarters of a billion dollars right now worth of financing. So companies that hire us to come in to do valuations. We now work with insurance companies to basically put wraps, insurance wraps around that product. And then we can use that as a nice collateral product to actually get uh, loans and lending. So we've got, we've got a lot of things going on right now uh, for that as well. So lots going on, uh, I'll, I'll end it there, but uh, congratulations again, really excited to be part of the part of the team again. And thanks, Joseph, for your really kind offer. And also, I will make sure you're going to follow with all your offers and everything. And then I will just make sure that, and that all the startups can have an offline meeting with you guys and that they have a really, you know, the, the synergies with you. Thank you. So our line's always open. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, last but not least, uh, let me introduce Mr. Carlo Tortora Briada de Verbedere. Yeah, I always try to you know, practice your name, <laughs> Carlos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he's the founder of uh, Tortora Briada Institute and also Good Luck Corporation. So, they are also great supporter of this program. So, Carlo, tell us about yourself and also give us a little bit about your offer on the marketing or the advisory support, those programs, and why it is important, uh, how actual startups can benefit from your offer. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So uh, a little background on myself. As you say, I'm um, executive chairman of the Totoro Breda Institute, which is a um, private public uh, um, think tank uh, focusing on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity in particular. Um, I'm also um, a co-founder of the United States uh, uh, National Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity Information Sharing and an Analytics Organization. And um, my history really is very closely intertwined with, uh, with the UN system. Uh, I've always been uh, uh, working alongside the UN system, never as a UN employee, but as a consultant 
or as a speaker on uh, a number of different uh, UN um, circuits like the World Summit for Information Society. Um, and, um, and for uh, about a decade, I've been working very closely as, a, as an expert on uh, um, information uh, technology innovation uh, with the World Economic Forum. <clears throat> so what, uh, what I can bring to uh, the table today is my expertise as a go-to-market specialist. Um, that's really fundamentally the, the core of uh, what uh, Gorilla Corporation has been doing for three decades. And uh, we wish to support the winner of today's contest with uh, uh, a platform which is really designed for uh, partnering and succeeding in, in partnerships. Uh, any business uh, needs a number of different uh, partnerships, especially on the reselling side in order to succeed. And, uh, and we provide uh, a go-to-market, uh, let's say, approach, uh, consulting and software approach to help, um, help companies to succeed. So we'll be uh, really looking forward to this contest. I've had a previous, uh, I've had a look at all of the pitch decks and they're all extraordinary. So it's, I know it's going to be a, a tough one, but I'm very honored and privileged to be able to sit here and actually hear these wonderful entrepreneurs pitch their ideas. Thank you very much, Paula. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the uh, how you know the startups are using your platform and then they actually make the grow and then also how they actually scale up through the support of the program. And, and I'll also share the result and achievement of this startup next year. So I have such a great thanks a lot. Josh is muted, I think. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot again to uh, all our judges uh, for taking your time today. And I'm also very, very happy to have such a wonderful, amazing judge pool. Okay, so for those who are watching this session, please note that you guys can also vote for your favorite teams. So after the all teams finish their sessions and finish their pitches, and we're going to show a, a link and a QR code, then you guys can visit the site and vote on your best teams. The winner of this audi uh, audience choice will be interviewed by the ITU communications team, and then they will be featured in ITU Blog, uh, separated from uh, the prize that we are going to provide uh, from the, uh, the sponsors. Uh, sponsors, sponsors prize. All right, so now uh, let's move on to today's pitching competition. The first team is uh, Cipremo uh, from Brazil. Uh, Cipremo is a startup that, that empowers the intelligent decision making to take on climate change. So Gabriel, our stage is yours, so you can share your screen. And then as I said, you got five minutes. So I'm going to be very sharp because we've got five teams today and so we've got a lot of other things. And then uh, 10 minutes of journey will be followed. Are you ready, Gabriel? Yes, are you seeing my screen? Yes, so please go on. Thank you. Okay, cool. So hi everyone, here is Gabriel. I'm CEO here in Supremo where we do natural disasters and weather forecasts um, and monitoring. We are an AI, an AI driven solution for proactively building resilience, reducing the reactivity in natural disasters management. Supremo saves lives and improves critical decision making for companies and governments alike. Uh, the problem we're solving has caused more than 1,000, more than 45,000 deaths every year, besides the environmental and economic social losses we have, uh, they're being even huge. Uh, year by year. And after cut a horrible flood here in Sao Paulo um, in 2016, and I saw people's lives and livelihoods washing away, then I knew I had to do something to change that reality. And when I was invited to work with Sao Paulo State Civil Defense, which is the most relevant player for the whole South America, I knew that was my chance to change that uh, scenario. And uh, with our mission to empower intelligent decision making for companies and governments while dealing with weather events and climate change, we created Supremo. So, which is uh, Supremo is an AI driven solution uh, capable of providing information on where, when, and what weather event may occur in the future and how it will impact the operations we are covering. We're uh, from, and from the weather perspective, generate operational insights and 
these are the top 10 events we're able to cover. And they are the top 10 of, of incidents, not only here in Brazil, but all around the world as well. And that's how our technology works. Premo's AI monitors the area 24 hours a day. And when it predicts an imminent disaster, an imminent weather event, we notify our users so then they can act on this opportunity window before the event happening, understanding what will happen in the future and how they will be affected by that event. Our technology can absorb parameters, metrics, guidelines, emergency plans, and more, and take it all to improve and to help our society to deal with climate change with resiliency, proactivity, and assertivity. Today, our projects are uh, running in all of these different is, industries. We're helping them to understand how the weather will impact each operation and all of them to be uh, resilient and assertive. As you can see, we are generating different operation insights for different industries because climate change affects them on different ways. And we are ready to help everybody to deal with this on the best way. And well, this is a very important thing that I had to highlight here is that we're not only a meteorological forecast. Our differential is that our technology is unique and comprehending what weather event will happen in the future and how it will affect you and what you have to do now to mitigate or even avoid the whole negative impact that that event will cause in your operations. We already have been generating great results for operationals, financial and environmental standpoint for every operation we are working on. And one of the most important one is the proactivity while dealing with climate change. Uh, we're still contributing directly to develop a resilient culture and more sustainable action in the industries we are working on. And this is just possible because we have this amazing team with amazing backgrounds and key areas for uh, delivering great solutions for the challenges we are working on. Uh, by working with Supremo, you can expect for predictability, assertive decisions. Uh, all of our solutions are aligned with UN, ICE Plus, the CFD. We bring innovation and technology for the sector, but the most important thing is that we offer a way to develop a resilient of a future of resilient and a way to do a climate-friendly management of their operations. We're now having operations not only here in Brazil, but in the United States as well. Um, with our technologies internationally awarded, we were invited, for example, to present this technology on COP26 last year and helping us winning the AI for good, you help us to make our impact even better. We will accelerate our market efforts to promote resilience and sustainability, uh, extend our technology to new industries, improve our positive impact and increase our positive impact as well for our peoples who live in vulnerable areas here in Brazil. So we're supreme over technology forecasting the future and ensuring our present. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gabriel, for uh, you really you really kept the time. So thanks a lot <laughs> for finishing your uh, presentation on time. Okay, so let's move to uh, the Q and A. So who's okay? So Melissa, you can go first. All right, cool. Um, tell me a little bit, and I might have missed it. Um, but tell me a little bit about how you make money. What's your business model? Uh, that's uh, that's a very important question, Melissa. Uh, our business model is based on SaaS, so we have a monthly fee, and the ticket is generated according to the extension of the area we are covering. Okay, and what uh, what amount of revenue have you brought in uh, thus far? Yes, we are already having revenue. We have uh, we're profited uh, today. We have mm -hmm. operations in all that different industries in different applications, and we're. Uh, generating revenue for these projects from uh, uh, projects on uh, operational and from pilots and POCs as well. So let's say uh, the the amount. So like let's say less than a million dollars, more than a million dollars. How how big are you? Uh, uh, this year we are about a hundred thousand, uh, a hundred a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, awesome. And remind me, when did you start again? We started in 2019. That mm -hmm. flood caught me in 2016 and that got in my mind and I had yeah. to do something to change this thing. But we started in 2019 inside Sao Paulo yeah. State, which is a government entity here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
And inside that, we started to develop as a project. And then we saw that we could uh, help not only the governments, but businesses and people and uh, everywhere. So then we decided to keep this project as a, uh, a company. And then it all came as we are today. Cool. I have two more questions and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. But um, how many women do you have in your leadership team? We had one that was okay. uh, under at the first uh the first team we when we started at sao paulo state civil defense and that's that's a very curious in, uh, curious history because uh, i helped to develop uh, an innovation center in my university <laughs> and at the time i was studying yet and i did uh, with the other professors in that uh, kind of a selection in, in the university to to, to join the first team and the first squad. And then we started to work and the, the founders came from this uh, selected inside the, the university. So we all came from the same places and uh, started to, to work in, since there. Okay, cool. One more question and then that's, that's all I got. Um, tell me about your tech stack. Our tech stack? Yeah, your tech stack, your technology stack. So. You know, yeah. uh, how have you built your solution? You know, what yeah. cloud are you using? Tell me about your technology. Yeah, yeah, it's all uh, made it by uh, our own hands. So we developed in, in house. Uh, it's an AI driven solution. We developed as a semi supervised model based on neuronal uh, network. So we have all these uh, sort different sources from data came from private sources, public sources, uh, customers. We have our own bots to develop it all and we take it all at this um, uh, neuronal uh, uh, model. And then we have the model algorithms to, to do the, the analysis and then we reach the goals and relate the predictions of the events to the impact they will cause in each operations and then by this relationship, can this can generate this operation in size, understanding what will happen in the future from weather perspective and what this weather event will, how this weather event will impact the operation, and then generate these operational insights. Okay, and so uh, I, I still didn't hear um, what your tech stack is, um, and that's okay if you don't know, and if it's your uh, chief technology officer or you know uh, that that handles those questions. All right. Okay. So maybe we can move to another judge for their questions, please. So, yeah, Carlo, please. Happy, happy to jump in. Uh, yeah, uh, Gabriel, can you tell me a little bit about um, uh, your competitive landscape? Um, I've seen uh, a number of solutions arise over the last few years in uh, this kind of disaster prevention. Um, what's uh, what makes your solution stand out? Wow. Well, cool, Carlo. Uh... This methodology and the technology we developed to develop to create this call frameworks when we understand and develop how these uh, events were forecast and will affect the, the operations. We call it framework. So the process we developed to, to comprehend this impact on each operations is our, is our uh, key. This is what makes us differential for the other ones. Thank you. I'll, I've got another question, but I'll save it in case I get more time at the end. Uh, I'll, um, I'll let the other judges go, go along. Hey, uh, Gabriel, nice to see you again. You and I have probably had two or three offline discussions. So this is probably more so just to educate the folks that are listening in. Um, so talk a little bit more about the maturity of your technology. Uh, you know, it sounds like you guys are product ready, right? Talk a little bit more about that. And also more specifically, moving into 2023, it sounds like you've got about $100,000 in revenue right now. Moving into 2023, talk about your pipeline. What are you guys projecting to be roughly from a revenue perspective? I'm talking about real product revenue as opposed to POC proof of concept. Yeah, Joseph. Wow, great to see you again. Um, yeah. We're we're projecting a 340 percent growth growth rate for the next year, and our pipeline is to scale up our solutions in the verticals we are already working on. So as you saw, we have solutions in all the different industries. We are working on seven different ones. Uh, our plan is to scale up as we already have results and KPIs to set, say that we are already proved in that and we're already generating uh, results and helping them to reach the goals. 
And then after scale in the uh, in those verticals, we are looking to um, to expand our uh, positive impact by um, it's like um, knowledge management. We are we are one, we're willing to take all this this knowledge we're taking from comprehending the climate change, the weather events, and all these stuffs, and generate uh, 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 as I mentioned knowledge management and uh, marketing a uh, marketing strategy to uh, to uh, to spread all this new this knowledge we're we're getting on the uh, on the operations we're getting on so basically a scale in the verticals we're already working on and then taking these results as a uh, marketing strategy to spread this uh, uh, the word of climate change okay. and resilience. Okay. Yep, yeah, and I know we're running out of time, but just I just want to uh, just hone in real quickly on that uh, that technology maturity question. So when you think about TRLL technology readiness level, uh, design, development, and then deploy. Where are you with your product right now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to uh, forget that. Uh, oh, no we're 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 good in that. We we have the process all down. We have all the methodology down. We have process to scale up as. Uh, as easy as we can. Uh, we, for example, we have our setup today done in two weeks in every uh, every operation like that here in Brazil. So uh, the process to uh, to map, deploy, and start an operation is very easy for us. All this, uh, this design thing about technology standpoint is very mature from our standpoint. We're very good on that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Stephen, it's your turn if you have any question. Yeah, I'm actually quite good. Um, <laughs> uh, all the other uh, judges did great questions. So they answered all the ones or asked all the ones I was interested in. Okay. Great, thank you very much. So thanks a lot, uh, Gabriel, for your presentation. Also, thanks a lot to all our judges for great questions. Also, see your sincere answers as well. So good luck to you. So thanks a lot again. All right, so let's move to the second team. All right, the second team is Telebionics. So we have Agi, who is the co-founder and uh, uh, of Telebionics. So Telebionics is reimagining the future of healthcare and transforming digital health by measuring our daily health, providing AI-driven insights and keeping you connected to your, your caregivers. Uh, so uh, Agis, uh, floor is yours and then you've got five minutes. And again, as 10 minutes, uh, Q&A will be followed. So stage is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be today here. My name is Elias Shabib. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Telebionics. We are a California-based mid-tech innovation company, and we have created the platform that will finally enable the transformation of digital health, providing real-time patient data and allowing more people than ever to access quality health care and save lives. We have a superstar team with many years of experience and proven track record delivering informative, transformative and disruptive products at top companies like Apple, Tesla, Fitbit, Amazon, Microsoft, and AstraZeneca. My partner, Willie, and I, we already have two successful exits from company in cybersecurity and automation. We are tackling a massive problem the healthcare system is facing the high number of patients managing chronic diseases, the growing age population, and the 66 million people live in rural area in the US without access to primary health care. And the very alarming and growing shortage of clinicians, our target customers are challenged to receive quality health care remotely without the hassle of in-person visit. That's why we built the world first all-in-one biosignal device that measures seven different vital signs. And this is the actual size of it. You can literally hold it in the palm of your hand. Let me show you how it's work. With one click, I can do blood pressure, toughness, very important, heart rate, heart rate variability, blood oxygenation, body temperature, eight lead ECG, as good as the 12 lead ECG we have usually in the hospital. And we have here a digital stethoscope for the heart and lung sample. It's connected to our secure mobile app allowing us 
and allowing our customer to access care from anywhere. We are leveraging edge computing and AI correlation to empower our customers with actionable insight and alert them about their health condition so that they can seek care proactively because we truly believe that the future of healthcare is the ability to move from reactive to predictive and proactive. And we can achieve this today with the power of big data and AI. And what makes us really very unique is proprietary algorithm. So we put the best medical clinical grade sensor into one device combined with in-house algorithm for auto calibration and increasing accuracy. And our team, 15 years of scientific study in predicting medical conditions through vital science, coupled with our powerful solution, will be the accelerator to push research into better treatment and prediction for anything from drug development, clinical trials, diabetes prediction, to cardiac condition, pregnancy and emergency, and much more. Today, we have the prototype ready for mass production. We see scary traction from customers and channel partners, a very solid pipeline valued at $5 million. On top of that, we secured LOI for valued at $3 million, which will open for us a gate to access 37 million customers in the US. We already submitted four patents and we have more patents in process. In terms of third party validation, we received multiple awards, but we are very proud to be today here presenting. Uh, we are also part of IPM Hyperprotect Accelerator Program. We successfully graduated from UCLA Health Equity Program, and we have been selected out of 3,300 startups as a winner in the most fundable company competition by Pepperdine Business School. Remote Sense Health Solution, it really can add value to anyone, but we see the most impact in user with limited mobility, uh, people with chronic condition, the elders, and unserved and underserved community. Our business model is B2B, focus on telehealthcare providers and healthcare providers. The revenue stream will come from both the device sales, but also we have a recurring licensing subscription at very attractive margin, customer retention rate. Telebionics is a high impact company, according to a third party evaluation done by Vested. The report is methodologically aligned with the global standard and leaders in impact assessment. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a lot of questions for me. And thanks, Aki, for your presentation. Okay, so Melissa, you're the first. Okay, please go on. Yeah. All right, cool. I, I promise to go quicker this time. Um, all right, so. Um, if you are focused on underserved and underrepresented communities um, as part of your, you know, uh, focus area or your your target market, what um, what challenges do you think you'll have when it comes to the digital divide in rural America? Number one, number two, lacking digital skills amongst many people, both old and young. It's a very good question, Elisa. We really built the products that uh, uh, my, my grandmother can operate it. It's connect very easily to the, the, the uh, mobile and you can step by step uh, really it's built the whole concept around it that kids, uh, from kids to, to really elder people, as you remember also not only the unserved and underserved community, elder people is one of our target uh, customer group. Now, what we will see as a challenge maybe is the connectivity issues in some rural area, uh, but we believe the penetration of internet. Uh, my mother, the 75 years old, she have already paid book uh, and she is working with it properly, WhatsApp, everything else. I believe the generation is now, and especially after the, the COVID uh, hit, it's more exposed to deal with digital and they are more open uh, to deal with digital and this is according to a certain study we already saw uh, recently. Awesome. But okay, it's will cool. be education progress. <laughs> it's we need exactly. to awareness, education and collaboration, I believe, also with government and uh, non-profit uh, organization. 
Yeah, I, uh, I'd love to maybe um, connect with you after this. I have an idea for you when it comes to um, sharing digital skills with the elderly and someone who has a large number of grants across a number of different uh, states that I think uh, would um, kind of go hand in hand with what you're doing. So I'll, I'll put my uh, email address and my phone number in the chat window. So you know, feel free to reach out and we can chat. Um, all right, two more questions and then I'll shut up. Okay, one, are you running on HyperProtect then, since you are part of the IBM HyperProtect Accelerator? Uh, are we what? Uh, sorry. Are you are you running on HyperProtect? Meaning? Yes. Are, yes. Okay. All right. Currently, well done. We awesome. are mi yeah. migrating yes to HyperProtect okay. because we see really uh, very good add value for us in terms of security. We're dealing at the end with health yeah. data and cybersecurity for us. Good. Uh, very very important. Good. I'm glad to hear that. As uh, Josh mentioned, I uh, I created that program and you know left it in the hands of Village Capital and uh, Adam Ring. So awesome. Uh, last uh, last question. I swear I had the last question and it just slipped my mind. So if it comes to me, I will uh, I will uh, raise my hand again. But I, I forgot my last question. So there you go. I think I got too excited talking about hyperprotect. So next person. Thank you, Okay. Uh, why right. don't we? Thank you. Uh, why don't Why don't we give a floor to Stephen first because he was the last. So yeah, if you are guys okay, okay. Stephen, do you have any question? Yeah, I mean, I can see you're targeting um, uh, the U.S. and and um, Melissa sort of alluded to this uh, as well. You know, so I'm I'm really interested in your scaling to other countries outside of the U.S. And so that's kind of one area. What's your price point? So it's probably it could be never, uh, or you may not be able to uh, scale to other regions of the world. Uh, I see big tech, uh, so uh, competitors are already in your space. I see some differentiation. You mentioned that in your deck, how you can sort of uh, customize to the different parts of the body and so on. But you know, big tech is becoming much more uh, capable. And I see some revenue projections and and uh, what's your repeating annual repeating revenue um, that you forecast for the next two years. So getting back to so three points then scaling to developing nations and how does that reflect from a price point standpoint your competitiveness against big tech who are becoming yes. much more capable and then your revenue forecast from an annual repeating revenue standpoint. Very, very, very good question, Stima. Uh, in terms of uh, expansion, uh, we have uh, as a next phase, it will be Europe uh, because we see today already a lot of traction from Europe, from distributor, but also from healthcare provider, customers and user. And uh, today in the US, there's, uh, we already, in terms of pricing, uh, we already fall under RPM uh, program uh, where there's a reimbursement code not only for the device, but also for the uh, cloud services on a monthly basis. Uh, you might hear in Germany today, the doctors are allowed to prescribe devices, home care, because it's big things now around the world. Uh, devices like ours, plus health app, uh, like they're prescribing uh, uh, medication, and uh, this will be covered by insurance. We believe this, the, whole, the rest of the world will follow, and including US, that will be really prescribed in order to keep the people away from hospitals, really to, to release the, 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 the stress on the healthcare system. Uh, this is the end user price. We are planning to bring it to the market as $270, uh, which will be the retail price, uh, but we're keeping a very, very attractive margin also for our shared, uh, sales channels and distributors. Uh, as you remember, maybe uh, we have two revenue stream. It's the device sales, but also subscription uh, uh, models. Uh, it is projected around like the next year around 1 million, 1.5 million. And this will grow by 8, 12, and uh, so on. But in the next five years, I believe the SaaS models will be uh, really our major uh, revenue. And we see ourselves not only device or only more data management uh, platform, more than really device uh, platform. In terms of competition, uh, you're right. Uh, we might think there's a lot of people doing what we do, but if you see there's not too many devices on the market that can do all this uh, 
measurement in one device is it portable device no one have it and i believe the competitive advantage we have our in-house build algorithm which is very unique and it's even attracted uh, the, the the attention of one of the biggest device manufacturers and wearable manufacturers to look at us uh, the all-in-one uh, the high quality at a very very attractive price which is like 25 percent cheaper than the nearest competitor on the market who have multiple modality combined with the platform uh, what was the third question sorry and the annual so, repeating revenue but uh, you know uh, but you've mentioned that already anyways right and and uh, i okay. can see then you're you're not addressing let's say the african marketplace or some of the other uh, regions of the world that's a sort of more western or or high income countries it sounds like right so yeah it is that phase different. three uh we have our plan really to to go to uh the, the, the african continent and asian continent this will be phase three in our expansion plan okay great thank you a couple of uh real quick questions uh on your device um i've seen other companies that are that are in fact, we have some clients that are doing this sort of remote diagnostic monitoring and sort of feeding back data. Um, in terms of your device, uh, I assume it, it will have to go through FDA clearance? Yes, that's true. Uh, okay. uh, we what, are... what, what, what class, what class category is it? Class two. It will be okay. 510K okay. class two. 510K, yep, okay. Okay, very good. But, where, uh, where, are, where are you guys with that whole submittal right now? Yeah, uh, we are preparing, finalizing now our pre-submission. Uh, we are working with a third party company who have been doing this since 20 years. And we feel very confident because the majority of the sensor we choose, it's either FDA approved or uh, it's uh, meet and exceed the golden standard. Uh, I believe it will be formalities, it will take time uh, within like eight months, we believe like by the end, uh, the fourth quarter uh, next year, we will be ready okay. with FDA. In parallel, we will do also the MDR for the European market. Okay, okay, very good. So basically a year from now, you think you'll get FDA clearance. You mentioned real quickly, you mentioned this device right now. I think you said the device is in protocol at this, not protocol, but prototype right now. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we are ready now for mass production. Uh, we're currently oh. discussing with a couple of uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, partners okay. uh, okay. to, to be ready for manufacturing. Okay, so from just to make, make sure I'm clear. Sorry, from a from a de, from a, a design from a design readiness and actually potentially deployment. You you believe your device is already there, and that, that's including how it's receiving clinical data and etc. and managing clinical data. Yes, yes. By matter of fact, uh, we are planning now for the uh, POC. Uh, it will be first quarter next year with our first project in hand, uh, which is three million dollars uh, we have in hand. Okay, we're good. Congratulations. Okay, we're good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Okay, so given the limit time, so we have to finish. So if Carlo, if you have a question, perhaps you can uh -huh. ask a question through the message to Aki directly through Zoom, all right? So that would be fine. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your understanding. No all right, so Aki, thank you very much for your presentation. So you. um, good luck to you. All right, so let's move to the third team, uh, the Blue Sea Robotics Systems. So we have the Tyler, who is the founder of Blue Sea Robotics, and they are uh, developing the uh, whole cleaning robotics to uh, make the maritime service clean. So, uh, Tyler, this is the flow is yours, and then you've got five minutes. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Looks like that is a... Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, we are Blue Sea Robotic Systems, and we have an autonomous hull cleaning robot. Um, there we go. Uh, the shipping industry emits 1 billion tons of CO2. Uh, that's as they consume 300 million tons of oil every year, which is 5% of the global supply. Now, hull fouling alone accounts for as much as 20% of this fuel consumption. And what happens if you put a, a new ship into the ocean? Within hours, you start to get bacterial growth on the surface, and then days later, um, about a week cadence, you uh, you start to get what's called microalgae or slime built up on the uh, the surface of the ship. Weeks after that, you start to get soft fallers and then hard fallers. And the issue is once you start to get soft fallers, you need to have aggressive brushing, which breaks down the surface of the ship, 
you also are already at 20% reduction in, uh, in uh, fuel efficiency, 20% uh, increased drag. Um, and once you get the hard ballast, you have to pull the entire thing out of the, uh, out of the ocean and, uh, and sandblast, repaint in order to get the barnacles and uh, mussels off the surface. So what we do is we look in that first week, we have a robot that hears itself to the hull with magnetic tracks. And through an AI system, it navigates the, uh, the underside of the ship so that it can lightly brush the surface to remove the slime. It can clean the entire ship in two days and work even at speeds up to 25 knots. And this is really important because by cleaning in deep water, we prevent the ecosystem contamination that happens when you um, clean invasive species that were collected in one port off in another. Um, in order to do our event planning, that's also another big application of AI for us. Uh, we spun out of Raytheon and we have six global patents that uh, protect our ability to deliver this product and uh, protect us against uh, early competition. In our market, we are looking at really the smallest portion of the market because it sees the highest ROI. In the container shipping industry, fuel accounts for over 50% of their operating costs. Now, if we were able to take one ship and continuously clean its hull for an entire year, that ship would save $2.5 million. 25% market penetration into just the beachhead market represents a $2 billion annual revenue opportunity. Now, this market as a whole, we're delivering a robots as a service. Our price point is $1 million per year per ship, and our customers see $3 million in annual savings. It's a three-time ROI um, when you include fuel, downtime, and maintenance. Our, our, our internal um, business operates at 80% margin. And as we go and penetrate this market, it's through relationship sales, where you have a demonstration that leads to large contracts um, at the likes of Maersk, MSC, CMA, CGM. This industry and these market players spend $225 billion on fuel every year. And that represents a, 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 serviceable operating, a serviceable opportunity market of $10 billion in annual revenue. Our team has done this before. We have 50 years of engineering experience combined. We have founded three companies, scaled and exited. We have four technical degrees. We've managed teams of over 200. Prior works on display in the Smithsonian. We've delivered billions of dollars in customer products. We, Jim is our CTO and he most recently was, the, was an engineering director at Raytheon. And I'm currently a, I currently teach entrepreneurship at Harvard University. Um, we would love for you guys to join our team and to uh, help us get from where we are to helping solve some of the world's energy problems. We're ready for questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Toddler. Perhaps now we can start with Carlo because he uh, couldn't have the time uh, for the previous uh, Q&A session. So Carlo, can you start with your question, please? You're a very fair moderator. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Tyler, quick question. So uh, in what way are you a spinoff from Raytheon? Um, first question. And then the, the follow-up question to that is, uh, is there an opportunity here for uh, third-party uh, service providers to be involved in your business? Like, for example, uh, I don't know, a supplier to a systems integrator to uh, supplier to Maersk lines, for example. Uh, would, would, could it be part of their solution or is it something that you want to sell direct only to the client? Oh, we definitely want, well, first of all, I will, um, Jim is here somewhere, so I'll have him. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm answer. here for the <laughs> So the answer to the, I'll actually let him go with both of those two answers because he spent a bunch of time. He actually invented this wallet Raytheon and as part of his uh, um, package leaving Raytheon has, you know, intention to spin this out. Is Raytheon's not really a product company. But Jim, if you want to kind of give the quick overview of uh, the spinning out of Raytheon and, uh, some of the ideas for uh, integration with third-party providers. Right, so, so, so can, you, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so my video is not working, but, but anyway, uh, so we developed this uh, technology at Raytheon uh, about 10 years ago in the Mission Innovation Group uh, at Raytheon. And, and the, the model back then was to take Raytheon technology, develop it, and then spin it out. And uh, 
it's, it's kind of a, a long story behind what happened to this actual product. We're getting really close to spinning out with Patel in a uh, robotic company in Massachusetts called uh, Blue sea, Bluefin Robotics. But uh, uh, an event happened uh, in the corporate structure that, that kind of put that to the side. Um, I was asked to go off and help in another area, which I did. And now uh, I left Raytheon last year, and now I'm, I want to resurrect this this this, uh, this technology. This, this it's a great idea, especially with the fuel costs uh, going high as it is uh, today. Um, and we would definitely uh, encourage third party uh, uh, partnerships uh, along the installation lines. We have uh, a company in Kiel, Germany, that is interested in work, working with us. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've personally went around the globe talking with uh, all the major shipping co companies out there, and they all said this is a, a no-brainer. If this works as you're advertising, we'll, we'll sign up for it tomorrow. So, so it's uh, and that's where we are. So basically, we're taking this technology. I'm the patent holder. And we're Raytheon's allowing me to, to see if we can, you know, get it out of the company and and, and start it all over again. That's where we are today. We we spent about three million dollars at Raytheon. Uh, we're probably about TRL three to four on this technology. So, but so, it needs, so you're it considering. Done. So you are considering uh, um, being proactive about um, reaching out to uh, partners that can help you uh, for the uh, sales and the ongoing maintenance and uh, and potential upsells. Absolutely, hundred percent. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. I'll hand over to the other judges. Yeah, yeah. Just a please. Yeah, real quick. I, guys, I was just trying to get a handle on this. What's the play here to, uh, nice job I thought you did, uh, Tyler, and sort of focusing on the profit uh, and the economics, but I'm curious, what's the play? I've always been a, sort of like a, a, a guy that enjoys these technologies that's really designed to sort of help the ocean, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To get it back to um, where it potentially where, you know, if you look at the damage we've, you know, humans have sort of done to it. So what's the play here? You know, at first time I've seen something on slime is, is the play to talk, what, talking about the, talking about the ecology piece on this whole thing, you know, the environmental piece versus, you know, making ships more, make, make, making ships more fuel efficient per se. So give, give me a sense of that. Yeah. Can you, can you see my screen again? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. So as, there's, there's two kind of components. One, the slime builds into things that, as you said, this isn't the area, right? The slime builds into things that create drag, that drag um, yeah. that drag costs us a lot of fuel every year, which costs us money and has a huge environmental impact on CO2 emissions. On the other side, if you are, these barnacles, these, these, these aquatic life forms that, are, that build on the ship, they get moved from one port to the next. And then there's mm -hmm. two big components of that. One is ecology. As you take an invasive species from one seaport to another seaport, you end up with real big problems. Um, we're up in Boston and we have a big invasive species called a green crab, which is wrecking havoc on the ecosystem. And likely it was transported over ships, you know, stuck to one as it was going from one port to the next and, uh, and came over to the Massachusetts ecosystem. And that means, coming from a business perspective, that means that as you do cleaning operations in port, you have massive obligations for recapturing anything you clean off a ship and often can't even do cleaning operations in many ports around the world from the, from the ecological perspective. So being in deep ocean keeps you from placing a life form in a... Um, in a port or in a similar ecosystem to where it was, where it can eat, where it can more easily become an invasive species. You're muted, so. Okay, I've got, I apologize. I've got a I've got a alarm clock, a uh, father grandfather clock going off in the background. I apologize for that. Okay, so 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 the play here is both ecology ecosystem plus getting us off, off the ships should help them from a fuel management perspective as well. Correct. Yeah, it's, but uh, but also the air pollution content is significantly reduced during the whole process, right? Because it's easier to move the ship through the water, so they they consume less fuel, therefore they pollute pollute less. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, and then okay, and the, and the last thing I think you you had mentioned, Jim, from a TRL, you guys are at three or four. Uh, what what's your what's your uh, 
um, what is your timeline relative to sort of getting the technology where it needs to be to where you can actually start using it? Yeah. That's a good shot right there, Tyler. So, so uh, the first, we're looking for, for initial funding of 2.5 million. At the end of yeah. one year, phase one we call, we'll have uh, a prototype uh, that's working on a steel plate, uh, you know, maybe in water, but maybe at least on the steel plate, uh, you know, testing out the, the pull, you know, the navigation, that sort of, uh, that sort of work. Um, Phase two, uh, it's, it's a 24 month, 24 months, we will have a working uh, model submerged in water. Okay. And then phase three, we have a full pro prototype on a ship, on a partnership, so. Okay, so you're, you're, you're three years away, effectively. That's correct. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks guys. Yeah, very, very ambitious, love it. It's very ambitious, I agree, yeah. but doable. It's basic engineering. I agree, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so we've got around two minutes, perhaps Stephen or Melissa, if you have any questions and yeah, let's go on. Yes, Stephen, please. Yeah, I got my questions answered, so keep rocking and rolling. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see you you got a concept, you got some proof um, through Raytheon and so on. So, but I'm also hearing that you're not full time. Uh, both of you, no, is anybody full time? No, not at, the, at this point. We are not. We we're going to. We need to raise that first two million dollar funding round so that we can, uh, you know, bring people full time and build a team around it. As you know, when you're looking at software applications, they make a lot of sense to kind of be part time, as you can do. You can get a lot of work done with low overhead costs. But when you're when we're looking at hardware, building out a hardware prototype. Um, the amount of value we can contribute in it as part time is pretty uh, is pretty limited. And I see the application of AI sort of minimal. The application of AI is pretty key. It's core and key to our ability to have the ecological benefits we were talking about before. Things like event scan or event planning, and then one of the biggest applications doesn't come at our first first deployment of a product. It comes as we. Um, as we continue to evolve the product, which is uh, um, computer vision for um, surface identification. So as you start to wear away paint and get chips in paint, that can be a really good indicator of needing to repaint the ship in a preventative maintenance fashion. Um, and then further developments onto, you know, uh, uh, thickness measurements, you know, sonar-based thickness measurements and things of that nature. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. I, I had a quick question, guys, uh, Tyler and Jim. How, give me, give me a little bit of a high level. I'm just trying to temperature check where are you guys relative to uh, equity interest uh, in what you're doing. Um, we we currently have 100 percent equity in the uh, in the company. No, but but in terms of in terms of when you think we talk about trying to you know suffice some of your capital needs. Between the equity debt, I mean, I assume you guys are trying to find some some investors to come to come into some equity for, into the company, right? Yeah, yeah, we're looking That's for good. we're looking for equity funding. I'm not sure that debt is a viable option for us at this risk stage. Obviously, I would okay. I would anticipate right. that no one would be willing Understand. to do that funding. Understand? And, and and where are you guys specifically on the equity raise or, or your efforts? Um, we are we we started to get a bunch of traction, and then early summer when the you know market and VCs started to sit and hold the equity, um, yeah. we we lost a lot of that traction, and so we're we're trying to evaluate and we're really really looking for somebody who knows the shipping industry and can be kind of that that bellwether uh, um, lead for for the investor raise, even if it's a smaller dollar value. Got it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay, Tyler, thanks a lot for your uh, presentation of answer to the really tough questions. And then also, yeah, I guess that you're on the screen and then say good luck to you. Okay, so now let's move on to the fourth team, Kit of Technology. So while we are waiting for Emeka to uh, prepare uh, his presentation, I just want to say uh, to Aki, you've got actually a question from Melissa in the chat room. I don't know whether you already have answered or not, but if you haven't, 
yet uh, checked her question. Perhaps you can go to the chat room and then answer to her. All right, here you go. All right, great. Okay, so Emeka, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, so I yeah, so turn on your camera and then share your screen and then you can start. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So you've got five minutes. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Watching the Mary America, and I'm the founder and CEO of Kitovu Technology Company. Back in 2014, the Oyo State Government in Nigeria offered the young people like myself the opportunity to, to start a farm without the hassle of owning a farmland. It was an opportunity that I took with both hands. But it turned out to be the longest year I had ever experienced because of the kind of challenges I faced. Because I didn't know a lot about agriculture, most of the decisions I made were based on guesswork and I suffered all through. My crop yields were very, very low and I suffered up to 40% post-harvest loss of my grains that I produced. It would take me another three years, but I eventually figured it out. And today, we've enabled over 16,000 smallholder farmers improve their livelihoods by helping them improve their crop yields and incomes. Let me show you how we did it. So, Akitobu built a digital agriculture operating system that comprises the yield marks, the storage X, and e-procure systems. The way it works is that we collect different kinds of data sets, soil, field, market demand data, and combine it with satellite imagery. Our algorithms analyze this to be able to enable us provide the farmers with personalized and precise recommendations about the kind of inputs to use, the quantities to use, as well as the variable application rates. Additionally, it allows us to provide the farmer with support throughout the crop growth cycle. When the farmer is ready for his harvest, he can either sell or store his farm produce. If he decides to sell, we, our e-procure system allows us to aggregate the different produce from different farmers in different locations and match it to commodity buyers and processors who are interested in what the farmer has produced. And if the farmer decides to store, our storage service allows the farmer to store without any challenge of upfront payment, and then issues them an electronic warehouse receipt that effectively turns their goods under storage into an asset to be able to really get collateral for financing. Today, we make money through subscriptions of about $14.5 per hectare uh, for the yield mass product. And we also charge $6 per ton postpaid for our storage X services. We also make a 13% margin when we connect farm, farmers' produce to commodity buyers and processors. Kitov is playing in a very, very huge market in Nigeria. However, today we are focused on about 2.29 million smallholder farmers with a combined market valuation of about $500 million across the demand for inputs and commodities. True, we have competition, but one of the things that differentiates us is our ability to provide these farmers with advisory that is personalized to them and end-to-end -end support without them having to pay any money upfront. Additionally, we ensure that these farmers are connected to the right inputs always. We have an excellent team, a team that has a 67 years combined experience across operations, procurements, agronomy, technology, and sales. Working together, we've been able to train 317 agents who have worked with us to onboard over 12,500 smallholder farmers, generating over $250,000 in revenue to date. We've also created some partnerships. These farmers have been able to increase their crop yields by 30%, cut down their input cost by 20%, and achieve a 100% access to market. Additionally, they've also achieved a 40% increase in their annual incomes. But that's not all. 
In enabling these farmers increase their crop use and reduce post harvest losses, we've enabled a savings of over 180,000 tons of CO2 emissions. But we know we can do much more. In terms of growth and expansion, we are looking at growth along three verticals, geographical as we expand across Africa, value chain as we enter into more farm products, and product expansion as we bring new products that are designed to enable smallholder farmers maximize their potentials while growing our bottom line. Kitovu is looking to raise $1 million split evenly between debt and equity. This fund will be channeled into working capital, further product development, our marketing and sales, as well as our buy now later plan, uh, financing plan. It will enable us to onboard over 50,000 smallholder farmers and be on track to hitting our target of $1 million in annual revenue by 2027. Kitovu is working to help build an Africa that not only feeds itself, but feeds the world. Join us as we transform African agriculture, one smallholder farmer at a time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your great presentation. All right, so maybe we can start with Joseph this time. Josh, I'm uh, you, I'm normally always kind of preparing, my friend. I'm I'm, just go, I'm just kind of going through the scores right now. So maybe you could defer someone else, and I'll jump back in. I, actually, I do. I you know what? I do have a question. I do have a question. Um, okay. Is is your product? Is your offering your technology and your offering? Is it is it solely focused on Africa? Do you have if that's the case? Do you have a vision of ultimately sort of going outside of your your country? Um. So. As of today, um, we are sort of focused on the global south. And that's because um, there's one unique thing about the global south when it comes to farming. Over 80% of all the food produced is done by smallholder farmers. And they have unique challenges that we are sort of tailoring ourselves to solve. So we are focused okay. uh, on Africa and subsequently Asia, but starting with Nigeria today. OK, OK. So Africa. Largely Africa, Asia at this point. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I think you did say you, you folks did have some revenue generation to date, correct? We did what? You have some revenue generation today. You you are making revenue yes. today. Is that correct? Yes, we and, are. And, we are right. And what and what amount how much is that? Um we started commercial operations 2018. Between April 2018 and today, we've done over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Great. I assume that's growing uh, each year since 2018. Actually, the the growth, to be honest, began in 2019 when we figured something crucial out. Um, so there was something. There was a huge disconnect. The problem was, the solution was great. The farmers liked it, but they couldn't pay for it. So we were hunting for people who would partner with, uh, until we decided, okay, let's let's um do a buy now, pay later, um, you know, track. And then we did it and the revenues picked up. So the bulk of the revenue started in 2019, slowed down due to COVID and then picked up again. Okay, okay, lo 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 love the effort. L last question, and I'll, I'll let Carla go. Um, talk, talk a little bit about AI. How are you specifically using AI in your technology? Okay, so, um, Today, specifically for our yield max platform, um, we collect um, farmer data geo coordinates, which allows us to pull um, remote sensory data. Um, we collect all this data, including um, soil data, and we've developed an algorithm that does the analysis. So based on the analysis, the farmer can know what type of fertilizer is suitable for his farm based on the nutrient level. And he can also um, know the variable application rate. So because nutrients are not leached from the farm in the same proportion, so he will know at this point, this is the quantity he should put. So that's where we're applying AI today. But there are other fields. Um, we are just waiting to accumulate more data in the area of um, pesticide, herbicide recommendation. Um, those are areas we're looking at. We're also looking at areas around using our weather data to um, predict things like um, uh, climate hazards, like um, give farmers risk warning as to areas where they shouldn't 
farm in particular times of the year because of drought or flood? Uh, you're muted, like Joseph. Anything. You're muted. Sorry. Th thank you so much. Uh, all the best to you, uh, certainly, as you continue to help your local farmers in your country. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question, Kai. So, yes, go on, Carla. Thank you. So, Mika, uh, just uh, um, in relation to what you just said uh, with regards to um, detecting uh, changes in uh, micronutrients and so on, do you, do you have um, sensors, uh, IoT sensors that go into the into the actual farms? Is that a, uh, how, how do you go about that? So, initially we started with sensors, um, but then we hit a brick wall. Um, in terms of the S as, uh, how expensive the sensors were and the fact that um, smallholder farmers um, will not be able to afford it because we are basically designing a solution for smallholder farmers. And, and then secondly, um, there was also the issue that most of the most productive areas where these smallholder farmers are, um, there is almost no connectivity. In fact, in some places for you to get network, you have to climb trees. So we had to pivot the data sources. We decided to rely on um, um, legacy data from ISRIC and um, other you know, accumulated data in the region and then extrapolate it. Um, where we currently use uh, sensors is actually for um, our warehouse management system because when, they, when the farmers bring um, their grains, we have a system that uses IoT to track for parameters, moisture, uh, relative humidity, temperature, and motion so that it doesn't get invaded by pests or rodents. So that's the way we are structured today. Thank you. And the, the next question is, um, you <clears throat> mentioned your commodity uh, marketplace, right? Um, yes. Tell me a little bit more, of how does how would that affect, um, for example, uh, I, I, I'm half Ethiopian. I lived in Ethiopia for about 10 years. And uh, when I was there, one of the things I noticed was uh, how disconnected uh, rural smallholders are from uh, from from knowing what the market pl pr prices are for their goods, and even having access to those markets, um, they they tend to sell very very locally at very and the the chain this, the the intermediary chain is huge, uh, and they, there's massive losses of opportunity uh, along that chain, um, and I saw situations whereby smallholders are selling like uh, hundred kilograms of avocados for like a dollar. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so how, how does your technology actually help in that practical example? Thank you very much. Um, I actually touch on two of our solutions to address how we work. Um, so for eProcure, we start first from the market. We don't start with the farmer, we start from the market. So we go straight to the final buyer, commodity buyers and um, processors, and we sign off take agreements with them. They agree, they tell us, this is the type of co um, commodity we want. This is the specification. Because most times, one of the things that affects smallholder farmers is that they just grow whatever their hands reach. So we come from the market data and tell them, grow this type of cassava, grow this, this type of um, maize. When they grow it, it allows them to have a guaranteed market. Now, because they are not going through a middleman, they're going straight to the buyer through us. Um, the implication is that they are able to get better prices for their um, commodities. But that's not all. Um, we launched Storage X to tackle one big problem. You know, during harvest, farmers are usually pressed to sell because they have numerous financial obligations. So what we did with Storage X was, okay, bring your goods, come and store it. There is glut in the market and they are pricing you for a dime a dollar. Store it, don't sell. But we know you have financial obligations. so. We are going to give you 50% of all the value of what you stored. You are not selling yet. So we give them that. They can meet their financial obligations. Then at the end of the storage cycle, they can sell and take advantage of market price you know, appreciations. So those are the two systems we try to combine to make sure that we get outsized value for smallholder farmers. Thank you, Emeka. Thank you. All right, I can uh, I can go. I guess uh, I just have uh, two questions, and that's uh, number one: um, with internet connectivity being a challenge, um, 
how do you and and affordability data you know affordability of data another challenge right um and then digital skills another challenge how do you plan to overcome those challenges you know with uh you know local farmers to one make sure that they've got access to data two that they can afford the data and three they know what they're doing with the uh the tech in front of them thank you thank you very much for that question when you were asking the question i just i was just my mind was going back to you know the past it took me three years to find answers to this question that you're asking right now the truth is that um it's going to take a long time for a lot of things to change in africa in nigeria for instance today the average age of smallholder farmers is 64 years. So it's a tall order trying to teach them technology. Did you say, so, did you say 64, 64, 64? 64. Oh, yeah, okay, got it, thanks. So if you, if you say you want to teach them technology, that's going to be a tall order. So part of what we did was to carry out a business model innovation. What we did, we use an agent network. We find young people who, and there are many of them, who have graduated from school, from universities sometimes, but don't have any jobs. So we train them on extension, train them on the use of the technology. They are the ones that go to these locations to capture data. Now, our platforms are designed in such a way that it can capture data without internet. And then when you're in a place where there is internet, it collects the data and uploads it. Then okay, got it. So it does work offline. That was really what I was getting at. So, okay, all right, yes. cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I, I love the concept that you're using, uh, you know, a kind of an ambassador model to uh, to teach digital skills. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, perhaps just a very quick question. If Stephen, you have and just one quick question, probably we can ask. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, I'd be really interested in your partner pipeline. So really to scale, you're going to need partners because your revenue is quite low, really, uh, from uh, your projection of 2027. So so yeah. you're working with okay. NVIDIA Equity Bank. Which governments are, are in your pipeline to work with? Um, thank you for that question. You know, as I mentioned, one of the challenges we have is um, that the, the purchasing power of farmers is low. So, so far, the challenge that we've had is that most of the things we've done, we've done bootstrap, we've provided finance of our balance sheet, so it's been tough. We've been trying to find financial partners. Um, so, um, even as we're working on that, let, let me even mention one. So, we got, we got um, from a, a partner, we got a forward contract, worth over a million dollars but we've not even been able to scratch the surface of it because again, it requires finance to you know, implement. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we are trying to raise financing because a bulk of our model relies on the buy now, pay later plan to hit a lot of traction. We can really scale our revenues very, very fast, but we are dealing with the reality of the situation that smallholder farmers will not be able to afford these things so um, while we are building partnerships, once we are able to find the right mix of partnerships and finance, we will really be able to scale our revenue. Okay, great. You, sh you should talk to Equity Bank. Anyways, I, I, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank can you. I, can, okay. I one, well, can I ask one more uh, Melissa, question? Melissa, sorry. Uh, Melissa, so the times of so maybe could you okay. ask questions through the chat? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, very I'll much. take okay. it. Yeah, I'll take it to the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so Emeka, thanks a lot for your pitch and also well done. Uh, good job on the QA session again. All right, so uh, let's move to the last team here. So, last team is called Bram Earth from India. So, we've got uh, Sanjay, who's the founder of the Bram Earth. And the Bram Earth actually provides a solution to monitor and optimize agricultural inputs and output to have a better yield and reduce and uh, reduce the environmental impact. So Sanjay was a flow user, All right, so I'll share your screen and then yeah, you've got five minutes. Hey, uh, good evening, folks. Thank you, Josh. It's uh, always wonderful to be part of uh, ITU. So climate impact is a major factor in aligning business goals with clients and partners. So we at Bramworth build an infrastructure 
and the right tools and the platform that enables reduction in carbon emissions and GHG gases one item at a time. In doing so, we bring in new systems that foster a circular economy. I'd like to get started by addressing what is hard to do in the agri-tech space. As simple as it sounds, it's hard to do the right thing. Right from the high costs incurred to provide equipment, to have the right quality control for reliable production, by the time any of these solutions reach the farmer, cost cut into the savings of the farmer. Everyone is trying to solve this in their own way, but there's no need for everyone to spend the same kind of money on solving the same problem. Our clients can use our AI plugins to implement their solution reducing the costs. AI allows better quality control for the solutions implemented. Using our AI plugins is the best way to eliminate high entry barriers into new sectors. Our revenue model doesn't touch the farmer. It works on the costs saved for the agri-tech companies. Now, what does this solution look like? We're offering a platform that has four major components. Microcontroller in the form of hardware and modular circuits to do the scanning. Crop SOPs that are customized for every farmer's needs, a community place or a marketplace where you can share valuable insights and stats, and an AI dashboard for continuous monitoring and key insights. How does a client access this? Through our Gram AI platform. Now let's dig into each one of these. First up is the microcontroller. So the problem we're solving is that agri-tech startups have a hard time developing hardware links to their applications with modular processing capabilities and communication platforms. Our platform as a product is a piece of modular and scalable hardware, agnostic of any type of farm, which comes with a set of sensors and controllers, which shortens the go-to market time for these clients and also helps them reduce the development cost and time. This future-ready hardware cannot, can just not be used only directly in field, but also to develop different products. Deep tech development is time-consuming because of the amount of data-centric research involved in any specific type of company. So here comes our platform as an SOP. Our API-driven SOPs, which are built using a revolutionary controlled environment biome that can be used to plug in to speed up the inside development. These SOPs are tested in accelerated weathering conditions. These SOPs are accessible on our platform in the form of plugins. Nothing beats a great community. Our next-gen marketplace brings advanced techniques and recommendations for running a farm. Install a detailed fish profile, download an SOP from the leading aquaponics distributor, a leafy green crop profile from a hydroponic expert, and set up scheduled lab tests with approved laboratories. Our platform as a marketplace brings your library of best practices to run your farm in the best way. We all know data visualization helps make things simpler for everyone, but it's not easy to build a tool as it's time consuming. Our clients can use our platform as a dashboard or even use it to configure for their own key metrics. Let's take a look at how all of this is being implemented. So merging of modular hardware and AI is our BRAM biosphere. BRAM Atmos deals with carbon emissions and sequestration techniques. BRAM Lithos uses precision agriculture with AI to reduce operational costs and increase the yield. BRAM Hydro steps into soilless culture and renewable farming techniques with aquaponics and hydroponics. Since we are believers in test-driven development, we are building our own patent uh, pending products on our own platform. Here are a few examples. Bram Atmos brings a modular portable pyrolysis machine. This movable and tractor mount unit converts agri waste into biochar, biogas, bioelectricity, bio oil, and so on. Bram Lithos brings our advanced sensors and dosing kits, which are used in precision agricultural farming. Bram Hydros is a container biome that uses renewable techniques to farm, farm and test crops with methods such as DWT, Dutch, uh, Dutch bucket, NFT, agrivoltaics, and so on. We're glad to have like minds to work with us. So data collection has been a challenge and we work with agri universities to generate sources for historical data that can be used in modeling. Development and testing go hand in hand. We work with uh, multinationals globally invested in sustainability to drive this combination. Agri tech startups that are developing products and services can use our platform to build their products. So why are we targeting this sector? Despite the growing market, market penetration is less than 1% and that is why this sector is underserved. Challenges such as data availability are high. Seeds, fertilizers, insurance, exports, importers, all alike, they can use our data. Farmers earn their fair share and we don't want them to touch it. Our platform is built for the agri-tech sector and we will learn as they save up on the development cost and serve the market at a faster rate. We offer development uh, kits as products, subscription services for progressive development, and also licensing can be a part of our revenue model. We're working One towards the left. following SDG goals. So 1, 2, 12, and 13 are the SDG goals that we are working towards. Uh, meet us. We are in the business of uh, innovation and creation. 
So we are a group of people working together for a sustainable future. Thank you all for the opportunity to present. I am looking forward for your valuable questions. Okay, so yeah, who would like to ask question first? Just turn on your camera and just start. Okay, Stephen, please go on. Yeah, so where are you in terms of revenue? Um, you know, and, and annual repeat revenue. It, it looks like you're pre-revenue because you're not stating any kind of revenue figures here. Right, so we uh, just started out last year and we are still working on a few projects. We are uh, engaging with partners. We are developing, doing commercial projects which are uh, more, more for uh, gathering partners and collaborations as well as collecting data. So we are generating revenue with those projects. Right, so you're, in, just starting, uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're doing POCs right now, right? So. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, are they paid uh, POCs? Like, do, do you have yeah. some? And, yes, and yes, what, yes. Can you quantify that in terms of numbers right now or is it too early? They're, currently they're less than 100K. Right. Okay. And um, um, where do you see yourself competitively positioned uh, against others that are in the marketplace? Right. Uh, so in terms of uh, competitions, our competitors would be data gathering platforms and data gathering companies. Uh, we are more here to kind of uh, support all agri-tech firms, which will eventually spend time in collecting data. And so we would want to uh, provide a platform and build tech that helps them do, do, do this faster. So I'd say that our competitors would be large data collecting companies. And uh, last question, uh, have you got any, um, You, I can see some recognition, but have you have you won some awards or were you out of the F World Food Program in Innovation Accelerator as well? Or was no, that- No, we another? were part of, no, no, that, that might be the other company or something, but okay. we were part of ITU and yeah, we were working with, we are working with the Indian government as well. Okay. I, I, okay. So uh, you're working with the Indian government. In what way are are they providing some funding, some granting as well? We are we are a part of MSME in India, so we are working with that division. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Sajay, what what's your um, let's say uh, the 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 plan for the next twelve months in terms of uh, what are the big milestones that you want to achieve um, over the next year? Right, uh, thank you. So we are currently working on commercial uh, projects. Right? So we are in the design and development stage. So we will be focusing on partner collaborations and onboarding micro entrepreneurs. For the year uh, 2023, let's say, we will focus on data collection and building advanced modules. So that would be our focus for the next year. And what kind of partner collaborations would you really um, want to see okay so in terms of partner collaborations we would be looking at universities to give historical data for modeling uh, we would also be looking at implementation partners who will uh, who will kind of test out and who will also be working with their products so anybody who is building uh, specific seeds or even cash crops so people who would want to test out let's say different parameters for cash crops and so on these would be the partners we'll be looking for and as I said, micro entrepreneurs uh, working specifically for certain things, we would like to accelerate their kind of development. So Thank those would be the key partners. Hi, Sanjay. Hey. Um, I, 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 could you be a little bit more specific on the actual problem you're trying to solve? You started out with your presentation with kind of like the the emissions, the carbon, right, the, the pollution going in the air. What 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 are you actually trying to solve from a from a environmental perspective? Okay, so for a lot of agri tech startups, face difficulty in connecting the other dots apart from their expertise. So if an agricultural startup, agri tech startup is expert in hardware, they would face difficulties building AI plugins or AI solutions. So their product would be incomplete or they would need time to get into the market. So we are trying yeah. to solve the go to market speed for agricultural startups or the accessibility uh, to data for those startups. Because since that is scarce and that is what we've been uh, working on. Okay. We, we, so there are like in India, there are like hundred or more startups and they're growing and we're continuously tracking them. Yeah. So yeah. That, 
there lies a problem where if, if they go to market faster, the end farmer benefits. Okay, all right. And then you had a couple of slides where you spoke about AI uh, around yes. the SOP. So you were talking about AI in terms of some of its benefits when you think about standard operating procedure relative to implementing what you're trying to do. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't quite pick up specifically what you were doing. How, how is AI being used in your platform or indoor technology? Okay, so I spoke about uh, our biome, right? So our biome is like an accelerated weathering conditions, uh, weathering station where we can test and simulate different kind of uh, crop conditions and everything. So there is where we use AI to build SOPs so that uh, any particular, uh, let's say, regional uh, changes happen or any particular company wants to try different crop or try different seeds or fertilizers, they can use this setup instead of going for an actual implementation to accelerate their uh, development. Oh, oh, and okay, our, the last question. Our, our dashboard, yeah. So our dashboard oh, okay. will also be presenting AI insights. Okay, very good. And the last question was around, is your focus, sounds like your focus is largely India. Anything, are you looking from in the future wise to move outside of India? Is it India specific? Okay, so our uh, devices and our platform is agnostic of the type of farming. So our uh, our platforms, uh, of course, uh, start out with India, but then we are still working on a couple of uh, companies which are in the Asia Pacific space as well. So it's not specific to India that our solutions would work. Our, we will be testing outside India. So. Okay, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, do you have any question? Melissa? Okay. Um, maybe she, she seemed to lose her connection or whatever. But anyway, well, if she got any questions, I will ask her to, to send the direct message to you, Sanjay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, we've just finished all the pitches from five best teams. And so I'm going to give a little bit of time to our judges to make the final decision on who is going to be winner today. Uh, I know it must be a very tough decision for you guys to, to select just one team. So you guys have to connect to uh, another call link that I actually shared before and to make the final decision and then select the winner and the second place. And try to be fast as much as you can. So perhaps max 12 minutes or something. So just turn off uh, your camera here and then just sign out and then log into to another link that I actually shared and then come back. And then one of you guys have to send me the direct message who is the winner. And just to be careful, not just to share this information with all other panelists here. So I'm going to open the uh, another call link here. Okay, so while our uh, judges are uh, making final decision, I'm going to have a little chat with the uh, finalists today. So I just wanted you guys to uh, turn on your camera and then just to share some of the, your stories. Here we go. So yeah, so basically all you guys actually won the, at the, each of our innovation you know, factory monthly session. And then we've tried to make the, any kind of follow-up actions with you guys to help you scale up. For example, uh, Brahmers, you, uh, uh, you were chosen as the you know, Share Game Changer program. And also Telebionics uh, yeah. was you know, invited to, to, uh, to uh, the IBM Hyper Protective Solar. So we would like to hear some more stories on how you guys actually you know, make the simple progress after this session and how you guys actually leverage this opportunity to pitch. So firstly, Abraham, Earth, and Sanjay, and after your pitch with the, uh, in, uh, at the session in partnership with the Shell, I heard that some of the stories that you already built with the Shell, and also you were invited to, I think, the web summit. So could you tell us a little bit about what the stories and how you collaborate with the Shell? Uh, yeah, so with Shell, actually, we've been working since quite some time and uh, we've been introduced to the sustainability uh, uh, division of Shell. 
and uh, i think uh, it, it was a very good uh, session post our uh, previous iitu event and uh, yeah our team is working on a couple of implementations with them right and then what about uh, the, the web summit you are also you went to the web summit together with the shell if i understand correctly right no i'm sorry no no that, that all right is, okay no. That was uh, another story. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, what about you, Agi? I mean, so you 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 were on the uh, you know, IBM Hyper Protective Accelerator now, and then tell us about your experience there, and then how exciting is it, and uh, any any interesting stories that you would like to share with us. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, the IPM Hyper Protect, we are almost like seventy five percent through it. The program. Uh, it's have been amazing, actually, uh, a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, interaction with IPM team, with the mentor. Uh, it's have been very, very good for us. Uh, it's exposed us on the open our eyes to a lot of tech that we can utilize. And uh, the most important, also, which is very uh, good also for us, is this now migration that we are doing today uh, to the hyper protect uh, cloud uh, it's very important since we are dealing with uh, health data uh, and ibm hyper protect provide really uh, we believe the most secure uh, cloud services and uh, there is a lot of ai uh, uh, tech we can tech stack that we can utilize also on our uh, platform uh, it's have been very very good uh, output let's say from the uh, event was at you. Thank you very much right. again for this <laughs> great opportunity. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, uh, well, we are basically building a stronger partnership with the uh, the IBM or AWS and share some other really, really big corporates who really, really are committed to in collaborating with the startups, investing in the startups so that we can really build you know, big synergies between us. And also uh, by doing that, the AI for Good Innovation Factory would like to become a really platform where the startups and big corporates can collaborate and also help you guys also scale up uh, your AI solutions to tackle the SDGs. So uh, thanks a lot for your sharing your stories. And uh, Gabriel, actually you were the winner of the first session of this year. It's a kind of a long time now. And then also, and I also uh, read the news from your LinkedIn about your uh the, the news about you know that you were selected as one of the 100 you know startups in brazil and also you've been working with the uh, also joseph about you know their you know advisory service and everything so tell us about some kind of achievements that you made you know uh, through the year well uh well, a couple months ago, <laughs> we talked, <laughs> but we have uh, some great news since then. As you already mentioned in our LinkedIn, we were listed as one of the best city techs for whole Brazil. It's a very important ranking they do here to, to map the ecosystem and see who are doing uh, deals with companies and innovate, innovation. Uh, with technology to the to the to each sector they are mapping. Uh, you mentioned at the at the first question to Sanjay about uh, about Shell. We are working with Shell as well. We are part of Shell startup engine, startup engine. Um, we are uh, at this project at this process uh, nowadays. So we are at the mid of this program as well. We were listed as one of the best golf techs for the third time as well, according to an university in Madrid. So this was, uh, as I mentioned, the, first, the, the third time we were listed in that. So this was a great honor to be part of that. And there's one more thing. Well, we got a lot of contracts to new clients. We expanded our technology to cover new areas. As you see, as, as you saw in our presentation, we have now operations in seven different industries. So uh, at the first pitch, I think we were working in only two or three, but now we're, uh, as you saw, in seven and in trying to expand. We are looking to to get the price here to expand these things as well and scale up in the verticals we are working on. And we were listed as well as, as one of the best um, best machine learning companies and startups in Brazil from now 
from an agency in London as well. So a couple of news we got at this last month. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so before I'm moving to another question to the other two panelists here, I realized I just missed a very, very important notice here. So Jinu, can you share the screen about our that audience vote for the best team? So the all the audience who are actually watching this session, you guys can actually participate in your uh, and the vote for your favorite team. So uh, you guys can uh, scan this QR code or go to, to this link and then you guys can choose two teams among these five and then we will have a long kind of audience choice session and then the winner of this audience choice session will be given as i mentioned at an interview uh, by the itu communication teams and the user will be featured again in the itu blog all right so yeah i'm just leaving this uh slide for the moment so that all the audience can have the time to to scan the qr code and then go to that side all right okay uh, and uh, let's move to uh, to uh, to Kito, Emeka, right? Um, so, um, well, I, as far as I know, that Nigeria is, is one of the really fast and growing countries in Africa in terms of startup scene, boom, and the AI. And then, can you tell us a little bit about just over landscape in your, your region on how the startups is really innovating, you know, the, your economy, your society, and then the, how uh, the AI scene is, is really, you know, evolving? Yeah, just th thank you for that question. Um, so um, that's a lot of um, innovation um, being developed in the country across several verticals, um, several startups are doing um, very, very interesting projects from uh, genome and DNA, um, you know, uh, records, like uh, uh, some startups are, are, are working around the human DNA and genome mapping. Um, gene, gene 54, 54 gene, yeah, they, it's, it's a very, very exciting work they are doing around health and DNA. Um, there is a lot of application in finance uh, using AI to um, create uh, risk and credit worthiness for um, would be, would be uh, people who would, you know, seek for credit um, in different, uh, different areas. But I think one of the challenges that um, we still grapple with is that um, they, they is a dead, there is a debt of data, right? So if, if you are doing anything with AI, it, it simply means you are going to have to capture your own data from the scratch. So, um, and even the people, few people who work in many areas, most of their work is usually siloed. So there is not, much, there's not, not a lot of um, collaboration um, so it's, it, it's a huge problem in terms of cost. And then we still have um, the, the cost of, um, the cost of uh, connectivity um, as a challenge. And then finally, I think one other huge impediment is also um, purchasing power. So sometimes um, it can happen that you can have a fantastic product, but it's, it's maybe too early for the market in, in terms of the adopters in terms of people who can actually pay for it. Uh, and whereas it solves the problem, but if people can't pay for it, um, it, it doesn't really get a lot of traction. Thank you very much for your information about the landscape in your region. All right, okay, so let's move to Talos. Uh, thank you very much for your patience to, to wait for your turn. All right, so and then you won the uh, Robotics uh, AI for Good uh, Innovation Factory session just in you know, a couple of weeks ago. And then actually you are the one of the really early stage startups, but you better against the old other in established startups and with your really great ideas and everywhere things. So just, uh, we, I, I'm just curious about, you know, what's the URL we Really, you know, um, you you already answered a little bit, you know, uh, to this question from the judges, but we'd like to know more details on how you are uh, planning to to go move forward to the next, you know, uh, five years. 
Yeah, I think one of the, I mean, you alluded to us being the earliest of these startups. We're also like strangely the furthest along in some ways, considering there's millions of dollars that have been dumped into the uh, product development of this. Um, there's a couple other uh, hardware startups in this uh, in this uh, boat, especially I'm looking at our telebionics that's combining hardware, health tech, and uh, um, those are really cost intensive uh, um, products to build. And that's a really hard thing to fund right now. So one of our biggest concerns mm -hmm. is, will we be able to find someone in the world that cares enough about solving this problem that needs to be solved um, to, you know, get from where we are to, you know, solving 1% of global energy. Um, for us, it, the first thing is finding somebody that can get us enough money to get all of the proof of concept done, right? Build out, build it out, make sure that all of the engineered math, all of the, um, all of the integration works. And once we get there, then we're talking another 6 million to get our, uh, to get our minimum viable commercial product um, built up, which those are massive undertakings and funding, especially for right. such an early stage startup. Yeah, um, yeah, so that's, sure, what sure. I, that's where our biggest concern is. After right. that, it's relationship management, large demonstration projects with, uh, with, with key customers. Fortunately, we, unlike a lot of the uh, B2C products of the world, we don't have as much risk in customer adoption because we directly affect the bottom line of their costs. So as long as we are, um, as long as we can prove we're accretive to their overall um, operating cash flow, then we are more or less a no-brainer. Um, obviously we're talking overall cash flow, so implications to operations are really important there. Right, right, great. Yeah, so uh, especially as a early stage startup, basically like with the seed funding that really you know drive your innovation is something that you're really eagerly to eagerly seek for and then really uh wish you the best to get really good investors to work with you and to really have this care of thank you very much all right yeah, so Gino, maybe we can stop uh, yes yes I want to ask there's a bunch of people in this audience the real the real key person to find is somebody who is in in shipping or is or shipping adjacent fund that that cares about this space that's where this whole conversation starts. So mm -hmm. there's a bunch of people in this uh, in this talk right now that will listen to it. So if anyone uh, if anyone knows someone <laughs> that truly really does care about this space, I would say send them to me at uh, Tyler at BlueSeaRobotic.com. Great. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. All right. So, Gino, maybe we can stop sharing the screen for now and then all our judges seem to come back here. OK, so uh, perhaps one of you guys can tell us the narratives on the, your selection. But before doing that, and I'd like to invite Ryan at the show, who is the deputy director of the TSB uh, Telecommunication Standardization Bureau of the ITU to make the final remarks. And he's going to announce the result first. And then maybe, Melissa, you can just tell us a little bit narrative. And then we give a little bit microphone to the winner for their what they feel. And, okay, so Ryan, and, and so, yeah. real quick, Josh, you saw my WhatsApp message, right? Yes. So I know okay. who's the uh, I know okay, who's the, the winner and the second place, and I okay, just uh, cool. let uh, Ryan know. <laughs> All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan, yeah, please, could you yeah make those final remarks and then announce the uh, second place and then winner, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Josh. So we have two prizes, two winners to announce, the second prize and the first prize. So I'll do this in a minute. Let me first uh, thank all of you, the uh, participants and the, uh, the jury and my colleagues. Josh, thanks very much. I think it's almost two o'clock in Korea right now for participating at the challenge. So we launched the Innovation Factory in 2020. And since it's launched, uh, it has attracted more than 300 startups from over 60 countries. Innovation Trans uh, Factory has transformed into competition. 
and is providing interesting benefits uh, to the best uh, teams this year through stronger partnerships with big corporates, uh, VCs, and accelerators. Our innovation factory has become an accelerating platform where the best of AI for good startups benefited from incubating programs, additional funding, and um, business opportunities with big tech companies such as AWS, uh, IBM, and Shell. Next year, we will have, in addition to our online program, an in-person AI for Good Global Summit. This summit will take place uh, beginning of July in Geneva. And uh, the uh, Global Summit will also include the Innovation Factory Grand Finale. Six teams will be in invited to the uh, Grand Finale event at the Global Summit, where they can showcase uh, their solutions to uh, top policymakers, UN officials, big tech companies, and then they can access uh, top class accelerators and incubators. The uh, five finalists, as we've heard, uh, achieved a lot this year. Some of you have been pitching at the Web Summit or have been top ranked among the teams in the IBM Hyper Product Accelerator Program. Etc. So now uh, we congratulate to all of you for your excellent performance this year, and uh, we hope that you continue to innovate the world. And now we come to our two prizes. So we have two prizes, a first prize and a second prize. I will announce the second prize first. So the uh, second prize is uh, Kitobu uh, Technology. So can we clap here, second prize. And for the first prize, we have as winner, Telebionics. So congratulations to the second prize, uh, Kitobo Technology, and to the first prize, uh, Telebionics. Back to you, Josh, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ryan. That actually, we are supposed to show some kind of a uh, screen that actually, you know, showing cartoons and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it really didn't work. Yeah. So, uh, Melissa, uh, the, tell us about the uh, how you make the decision on the, the why did the telebanks ah. won the, the second place and everything. Yeah. Well, besides getting in a massive fist fight with one another and um you know, us uh, beating each other to a bloody pulp. No, I'm just kidding. We uh, we we didn't cause physical harm to anyone. Um, at least I didn't. I don't know about Stephen, but no, I'm, I'm just joking. You know, it's always very hard. You know, I, I judge uh, lots of startup competitions. All of us do. You know, um, we see, you know, thousands of pitch decks every year. Some are great. Some are terrible. You know, we see lots of pitches. Again, some are great, some are terrible. Some people have their you know, business model together, their value proposition together. They know their product market fit. They've got their you know, business model. Maybe they've had some traction with either you know, uh, investment, revenue, customers, you know, whatever. It's always hard. And I think um, you know, there's also a little bit that comes down to the judge, the investor, the customer. And you know, there are, are, are some of us who might be passionate about one particular industry versus another. But besides that, um, I would say telebionics, you've got a wonderful, you know, wonderful opportunity ahead of you. Um, and I don't just say that again, because you were part of the accelerator that I created, which I'm so excited. That's awesome. Well done. And using my favorite technology. So well done. Um, but I think you've got a challenge in front of you as well. You know, you've got to yes. make sure that you get uh, the appropriate regulatory approvals uh, or you're dead in the water. You also have a lot of competition, you know, a lot of noise out there. Um, but I think all of us, we believe okay. in what you're doing. We we uh, felt confident uh, in, you know, everything that you shared with us. So congratulations and um, and thank you. Um, and obviously, you've got access to a number of different benefits that um, each of us are providing. So I uh, personally look forward, and on behalf of all of us, we look forward to carrying on, um, you know, with that commitment. And then I would say for, um, uh, on the app tech side of the house, so, 
I just want to make sure I got the, uh, Kitovu. I know I was going to say that wrong. So, so for Kitovu, I think, um, you know, it, it is hard trying to get capital in an emerging market. It just is. And it shouldn't be that way, but it is. And I think it makes your job extra hard. You're solving a big problem. You've got, um, I think, a, a really interesting way of looking at things. Um, well done. And again, I think uh, all of us look forward to carrying on in, um, you know, the benefits that are provided. The rest of you, you made it to the final. So don't go away thinking, oh my gosh, I sucked. This is awful. I'm I'm never doing this again. Um, you know, Canva pitched to 100 VCs. All of them said no. All of them. And look what size of a company Canva is today. So keep doing the thing. Um, and thank you very much. And I hope I, I, I represented the group uh, well. So Joseph, uh, Steven, team, feel free to shout. I know we're up on time now, so I will be quiet now. Thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations again, Agi, and also Emeka for your uh, the first place and second place. But as Melissa mentioned, all you guys were so great. So that's why we prepared the benefit for all the finalists. As I mentioned, the Red Capital will do the due diligence for all five finalists. And then, then also Joseph will provide some of uh, their own uh, their consulting service to top three teams. So uh, basically after this session, I'm going to arrange all the follow-up actions with you guys to get uh, have uh, to help you guys to get the benefits from the all different and offers and prices. And then, um, as you guys just remember, we've got also the vote from the audience. So I just was, wanted to share the result uh, from the audience uh, selection here. So audience best piggies. Yeah, here we go. So Brahmers. So Brahmars, actually, you are the best choice from the audience. So, so you will be featured in the uh, in the YouTube blog, and then also uh, you will also work together with uh, Joseph and all uh, alongside with the uh, the other two teams as well. All right. So we've got a Telebionics as the winner, and then at Kitov as the second place, and Brahmars um, as the uh, the best team of the uh, audience choice. But then the Tyler Blue Sea and also uh, the, the Gabriel C. Primo. So all you guys also have a great job. And then also I wish you, really, really wish you the best luck and then uh, good luck to all the teams. And then thanks a lot again to all our judges and our sponsors and partners and panelists, to everyone. And then also uh, let me tell you that as Ryanet just mentioned before, we're going to have a physical AI focus summit next year in July. And there'll be a really super big physical event where the finals of the next year Innovation Factory will have the opportunity to pitch in front of the, the high level policymakers, really, you know, at the top level, you know, UN officials and the big investors and the big shots and celebrity. And that is a really, really great, it's a really upgraded program. So, Keep an eye on our program so that I really wanted to keep in touch with you guys. And thank you very much for your um, uh, for uh, for you to watch uh, this session until the end. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. Thank <laughs> you.